I am Jason Verlindy, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal. This is the latest installment of Fretboard Journal Live, and we have a very special guest, Lawrence Juber. Nice to be here. Thanks I want to give a big uh, shout out to Martin Guitars. They are uh, our sponsor for this episode, and they've been very great in their underwriting of this crazy series that we do. And uh, before we talk to you, and before we talk Martin and, and all the guitars in your collection, can we can we hear a tune? Sure. Hoagie Carmichael, Georgia on my mind. arrangements which I mean there are so many of them that are beautiful so many great covers do they evolve as you go throughout the years or? Um, some do yeah. uh, that one is not completely fixed you know I'm kind of leaning as time goes on I'm leaning more into kind of the improvised end of the spectrum yeah so I'm giving myself more finger room as it were yeah or elbow room you know um, but then some arrangements are, you know, pretty much, I mean, 
you know, I am a walrus or strawberry fields forever kind of need to be what they are. Yeah. Because they're they're drawing on not just the song but also the record. Sure. You know. So it just depends. Sometimes uh, I'll I'll play with things. You know, and there's more and more this kind of the solo section gets to be improvised uh, rather than set. Does the gig itself dictate a little bit how loose you are? Or? Very much so. Where, where are you the loosest? <laughs> well, you know, the jazz clubs, just by definition, kind of there's an expectation of, of kind of getting out there on the tightrope. Yeah. Um, but the rock environment can be cool too. Really, it kind of just depends on the audience. Yeah. You know, it's just, and, and how relaxed I can be with it. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas, you know, if it's, if it's kind of, a very strictly controlled thing where you know if I'm on a TV show and, and they say okay you have exactly three minutes or whatever you know you kind of like you're just constrained yeah. but so you know and it I, I think that for me it's it's something that I'm trying to reclaim as far as the improvisational side of it because you know I started off with these kind of parallel tracks where I I had this ambition to be a studio musician, yeah, which meant versatility mm -hmm. and being able to understand a lot of different styles. So mm -hmm. I never, you know, I, I never copied. Well, I don't say never. I rarely copied solos note for note. Mm -hmm. You know, like except for like the Beano album and you know Hideaway. And, you yeah. Know, you know, I got kind of all the bits <laughs> in that because it was just so iconic, but. I tried to kind of go for the style and understand how the style worked and then just find my own mm -hmm. way of doing it. Um, so there was that kind of broad, uh, just educational side of it as far as, you know, just be able to handle any style. But then there was also this kind of bluesy, lead, rock lead guitar thing, you yeah. know, with a, you know, a succession of Stratocasters and Les Pauls, you know, my two favorite ones were stolen in 1976, Ouch. I think it was. So um, I learned at that time not to be too attached to the, uh, to the guitars. Um, but I also had this other track of, of like finger style and ragtime mm -hmm. and, and um, to some extent classical guitar kind of fed into that because it gave me some right hand technique but I was never very good with mm -hmm. classical repertoire any more than I was any good with play piano playing. Yeah. You know, I, I understood the music, but this didn't make any sense. Yeah. Whereas this did, but, but as time went on, especially you know, once I, I really started to have the time, once I got to LA in the 80s and I had the time to really start focusing, I just really got into fingerstyle and then realized that like Dagad actually offered me mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff that I couldn't get in standard tuning. I think that was part of it for me with the classical repertoire was that I was a big fan of records. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so listening to Paul McCartney or, or Carol Kay or James Jameson, these great bass lines, and then you didn't get that with classical guitar music, really. Yeah. Um, and you didn't really get it that much with jazz because, you know, it was not a finger style thing. Sure. Um, and, and so I just, kind of started putting all these things together yeah. and, and in the process I never really set out to be an arranger yeah. I started off just writing tunes um, and my first I guess three or four albums were mostly originals sure and then I did a Beatle album and it kind of opened doors yeah and I realized that I had th those skills too yeah. so that's where I went I know you were taking up guitar in the heyday of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, can't mention your career without mentioning Wings. Um, yes. <laughs> um, a wingman. Uh, yeah. I'm a wingman. Um, you know, is there, after that Wings experience, did you kind of just need to calm down and go acoustic? And was it a, a, a natural thing? Or, or was it a, you know, did it just kind of happen accidentally? Well, you know, I, I, I was a session player yeah. in London. And I was working seven days a week doing three, four sessions a day. Yeah. And, and a lot of the stuff I played on, I had no idea what I was playing on. Sure. I mean, I, you know, once in a while I did. I mean, I played on The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh -huh. And just the fact that I got to play, you know, the... Yeah. 
I mean, that, that to me was just an amazing thing because yeah. it was kind of an ambition fulfilled. And then I kind of got plucked out of that world and into Wings. Mm -hmm. and, and Denny Lane was really to blame for that because mm -hmm. I worked with him on a TV show and we played Go Now, you know, the old Moody Blues mm -hmm. hit. And, and he recommended me to Paul. Mm -hmm. It took about six months for that process. But, mm -hmm. And I didn't know any Wings tunes when I went into audition, but it didn't seem to matter. You know. <laughs> So, so it, you know, really, for me, it was almost like you know, the studio world w was a great experience. And then I kind of almost was like going back to school. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like going to McCartney University because I'm spending a lot of time just watching and learning mm -hmm. and realizing kind of how an artist like that functions. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a lot of understanding about that. And it, 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 that kind of sparked the idea that I could start writing. And so I did. I started writing some tunes. Um, and then when Wings folded and I moved to New York in 81, and then I started getting into studio work there, but I met Hope, who became my wife, and she was from L.A. So I settled in L.A. And it was much harder to get into studio work in L.A. than New mm -hmm. York. I got to New York and the phone was ringing you know, immediately, come play on this or that. LA took a while, yeah. um, but then Hope got pregnant on our wedding night, and it was like, oh, kids, family, yeah. don't want to travel, not when that's going on. So I just got back into the the studio scene, and while that was going on, I, that was when I started to kind of do the woodshed thing and mm -hmm. really start to develop the the acoustic stuff. And then 1990, I got offered a record deal and put out my first album, and Solo Flight, it was called. And I actually got radio airplay, and, and it was like, oh, I, I should keep doing this. Mm -hmm. There's something worthwhile. You know? So that was when the process started. So it was really kind of the 80s were, were kind of a bit of a kind of hiatus in, a, yeah. in, a, in that respect, because I just, I mean, I was very active. I was playing on lots of hit records and doing a lot of studio work. I was even a regular on camera on The Young and the Restless for six years, nice. playing guitar. Yeah. You know, and it was an after gig. You know, so those union gigs are really worthwhile. Yeah, you know. especially when you have a kid. Yeah, and then two kids. <laughs> so that was, um, that was kind of just really the woodshed period was the yeah. 80s. And then it, then it just started to evolve. And, and I, I put out my this album and then I realized that I was playing a guitar made by a man named John Lavoy who's mm -hmm. an English luthier yeah. and it was a cool guitar but very much like almost like a a Loden kind of mm -hmm. folk kind of guitar it was a cedar top with an imbuya body mm -hmm. and quite deep um, but very folky no cutaway yeah. and I walked into a guitar center in looking out for a classical for a, a, a cutaway guitar and I encountered Taylor, mm -hmm. uh, which was not, wouldn't, wouldn't have been on my radar, radar at all because I, I had a Martin M38 that was really kind of my main writing guitar. But for some reason I ended up recording this first album on the Lavoie because it just had a certain kind of sound and I'd cut my fingernails off because mm -hmm. I didn't like the sound, the clicky sound I was getting with nails. And so I, I, for a little while I was, I was a clinician for Taylor mm -hmm. in the 90s. Sorry, Martin. But, but eventually I made my way back to, to Martin because that really was the sound mm -hmm. that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. and, and so over the course of, well, the last 12 years or so, mm -hmm. with Dick Boak, we've kind of gone through a number of signature model editions. Mm -hmm. and this one is uh, it's an OM44. Okay. Strictly speaking, a 44 should have like binding, yeah. but I don't like binding on the, on the finger. Mm -hmm. It's it being in color, mm -hmm. but high glue, um, Adirondack top. Yeah. And, you know, it was just that, that whole end of it, the, you know, the, the understanding the luthery of yeah. it was a, was a long, long drawn out process. Because the first thing was, oh, Sitka spruce isn't doing it for me. So mm -hmm. it was like Adirondack spruce. And then... Okay, well, forward shifted, you know, mm -hmm. like it's a slippery vintage style. Slip. Yeah, it is a very <laughs> slippery, and it never stops too. Well, you're now it's like okay, torrified tops, yeah. non torrified tops. And and your model has not only been a very successful and long running 
signature series, but um, you know, it comes in a variety of woods over the years. There's well, been yeah, maple and rosewoods. That, that, that's and, been the grand experiment. It was yeah. like mahog- oh, the first one, the Uba Juba, yeah. as it were, mm-hmm. was mahogany and Adirondack. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was Brazilian, Indian. I didn't really want to do Indian, but they said, oh, please, please do Indian mm-hmm. because people like Indian. I'm, you know, I, I'm into the, you know, the velocity of sound concept where you, I want the sound to project. Yeah. An Indian you know, embraces the player. It's great for, for a certain kind of player. Or if you use nails and you want you know, to have that kind of that bed to cut through. But for me, I like, I like projection and I like presence. Mm-hmm. And Brazilian, I think, probably you know, is, is top of the heap. Uh, but I'm not going to cross any international borders no. with Brazilian rosewood. No. No. Having crossed, you know, go, gone into Tokyo in January of 1980 with Paul McCartney, who you know, ran afoul of their yeah. agricultural import yeah. regulations. Hard to imagine in 2015 that the yeah, pop that, bus yeah, that happened. Yeah, that, that it actually happened, but I was standing next to him at yeah. the time. So, you know, just walking through customs is, is not, especially now, yeah. you know, now with all the, you know, the different um, issues that, um, so that was one of the reasons we did Maple was because I wanted to, okay, this is a guitar that nobody can mm-hmm. point to and say, well, I think that's Brazilian rosewood, you know, because yeah. with Madagascar rosewood, you know, there's always sure. that possibility. And, and mahogany, you know, is kind of ending up on the, is going to end up on schedule one, too, I think. Yeah. So uh, this, this was a, just a, a limited edition we did um, in, in co-op. And it's a surprising wood because it doesn't, it doesn't tap. Yeah, like you'd think it would, you know, really kind of make a great sounding guitar, but it, it does some unique thing, mm-hmm. and it's it's not bad to, to travel with Spanish cedar neck on this too. Are these decisions that um, are you one of those guys who will still walk into a guitar store and geek out over vintage Martins and Gibsons and everything, or are you kind of taking the feedback from the factory? Um, no, I'll I, I'll take the feedback from luthiers mm-hmm. and from. You know, just what's available. I yeah. mean, it, what, when we started, there was no high glue. Sure. Right? And all the, the additions that we've done with the exception of this were still like shop floor. They weren't custom shops. So, mm-hmm. you know, acrylic glue rather than high glue. But those make great, they still make great guitars. Sure. Um, I mean, I'd be traveling with, you know, in the U.S., I'd, I'd have my Brazilian with me, but it just got a refret and it's still yeah. not quite recovered from it. Um, but the really for me it's just okay how how is this going to sound so the last one they did for me which doesn't have a pickup in it otherwise i'd I'd bring it out because it needs to be beaten up a bit is an oma team mahogany with a high alpine lunar cut swiss spruce top like a moon spruce top which is (laughs) spectacular okay um but i don't have a pickup in it and i don't know that i want to put a pickup in it and so just because I want to see what happens next. They're doing one in Guatemala and Rosewood with a, with a moon spruce top too. You know, for me, it's like the, the Adirondack's like a Fender amp and European spruce is like a Marshall amp. Okay, you yeah, know, it's cause a great Because, yeah, because the European spruce, the Adirondack doesn't compress. Yeah. You know, it's like the body compresses before the top will compress. Yeah. So you can hit it really hard. And you, you hit it hard on mahogany and it'll bark. And it, you know it'll really bark. Yeah. You know, the harder you play it, but but Brazilian doesn't really compress either. So you get you know that you get that strong you know kind of present loud kind of uh, quality to it. Um, but the the European spruce does compress, but in a kind of a really interesting way, kind of like a Marshall, like a Plexi Marshall. You know, you're up to five and it's still clean, but then you go to six and it's got some nice hair on it. Yeah. And I, I kind of like that. It's cool. You're one of the few players who can reference a Marshall Plexi as well as Moon <laughs> Spruce with a straight face. That's great. Um, have any combinations just not worked out where you're like, I can't put my name on this? Or they kind of know what they're doing? No, I yeah. mean, I, I pretty much committed. You yeah. know, it's like we didn't, I mean, we didn't prototype the Madagascar because yeah. I knew that it would be good. Yeah. And I would kind of place it somewhere kind of halfway between Brazilian yeah. and, and Indian. But, but the question is, you know, is Dalbergia Baroni 
really the best kind of Madagascar rose wool. At this point, we really will never know because you can't get the stuff out. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to see what the Guatemalan stuff does. Yeah. I tapped it and I liked the way it sounded, yeah. but you, know, you never know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, and I'm kind of done at this point. I don't know <laughs> what else to do, you know. I mean, yeah, you can thin finish. You yeah. know? I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't do another Spanish cedar neck. I, I like what it does. There's a kind of an airy, almost classical quality. Yeah. But I like mahogany for a neck because it just, it, it grounds it in the low mid range. Yeah. Um, so this was, you know, just another one of those kind of cool experiments. Richie Sambora got one of these. Okay. Yeah, he liked it. I was giving him lessons for a while. Yeah. So he said, oh, I like that one. <laughs> what did he need lessons in? Uh, he'd never played in Dagad, okay. and, and wasn't really kind of like a finger style player. So mm -hmm. we just sat, and I'd you know show him stuff. He said, "Okay, you know, teach me that." And nice. It was cool. Can we hear another tune? Yeah, you bet. This is uh, a, this is actually the um, the first cut on my new album. Okay. Uh, the album's called Fingerboard Road. Mm -hmm. Which is actually a freeway off ramp in Staten Island. All right, <laughs> but it, it was you know I, every time I'd pass it on my way to JFK Airport, it just always struck me as being kind of a metaphor for you know what this is, sure. you know, just you know, living on Fingerboard Road. Um, this um, this is a tune called "Without a Net," and it was written for a play of the same name that Hope, my wife, wrote which we produced last year in LA, and we're doing again this summer. And it's set in an improv workshop. So it's a teacher with uh, 10 students. And it's a scripted play, but it goes in and out of improvisation. Okay. So this was the theme I wrote for that.
Nice. <laughs> so you mentioned teaching, and I know that you have a, a new online teaching yeah, series. Yeah, with, with True Fire. Yeah. Um, rhythm Guitar. The series is going to is called Guitaristics. Okay. Uh, and it's just like an expression that I would refer to, and you know, as things being guitaristic. Mm -hmm. And um, Brad over at Trufi said, "Oh, that would make a great you know, series." Mm -hmm. So, and I just figured rhythm was the best place to start. And it's really, really basic stuff. It's yeah. you know, quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenths, and subdivisions and um, exercises and studies and, and stuff. And and it was not something I'd actually really put off doing that for a long, long time. They've been on at me for probably ten years to do something, yeah. and it, m most of the teaching stuff that I'd done, like the um, DVDs and things, were all repertoire driven. It's just that, you know these very fiddly finger style pieces mm -hmm. that people seem to like to learn, and, and then you know some of the arrangements. It's hard to do arrangements to teach arrangements because you have to get sync licenses and sure, you know, but. But I've done folios for Hal Leonard of the transcriptions. But um, but this was the first time I've really gone to that that level mm -hmm. and said, okay, here are the basics. Yeah. And and the fact is, ninety five percent of what you do as a studio guitar player is rhythm, guitar anyway. yeah. or rhythm banjo, or <laughs> rhythm yeah. ukulele, or whatever. Who were your big teachers? Did, did, did you kind of bloom when you were in California? And, and was it Ted Green? Was it, I mean, what were you exposed to? No, my, my stuff was really very early on. Yeah. Um, and most of it was just by emulation. It's like, you know, I, uh, there was a place I used to hang out at in, in the East End of London um, with a, there's a woman named Judith Piepe who kind of ran the folk scene in England okay. in the 60s. And, Paul Simon used to live there, and, and by the time I was hanging out there, it wasn't quite so you know, fruitful, but, but I was sitting there one day, and Davy Graham walked in, and, mm -hmm. and sat on the couch, and he showed me how he, he played Angie, you know, and it was like, oh, he uses his thumb, you know, not his, you yeah. know, I was doing it kind of, you know, more classical stuff, yeah. and, and, and it was little things like that. I, I got a lesson one time from De Derek Bailey. All oh, right, of yeah. course, yeah. I'm but it wasn't like paper clips on the strings. <laughs> it was like, you know, voicings of 13th chords. I mean, because he still had that whole background. Yeah. When I joined Wings, I took lessons from Ike Isaacs, yeah. who's just a great, great, great guitar player, you know, uh, Martin Taylor's mentor. Yeah. Um, and I took classical lessons, but, but so much of it for me was, was the understanding of music and then applying that to the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a few lessons to start off with, but you know the big thing was Bert Whedon's Play in a Day. Okay. That book was you know that that got me started. That taught me how to sight read. Yeah. In an afternoon, when the saints go marching in, uh -huh. and it's right there, and you know like there's a C. Okay, there's a C, and I just made the correspondence. Um, I played in the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, mm -hmm. which was you know just great drill in sight reading and you know there's nothing like being on stage in the band for Jesus Christ Superstar to learn very fast how to work with a conductor mm -hmm. you know? um, so there was a lot of real real time you know real world experience that went into it um, when I got to California it was really I think the education was much more in how to function as a studio guitar player and and just what happens when you walk into a movie session and, mm -hmm. and you know you're there's an 80 piece orchestra and you're in a, a, the isolation booth and you can't hear anything unless you've got headphones on mm -hmm. and if you miss them calling you know 2m7 or whatever the cue is you're really screwed mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um, and so there was kind of like the the work skill yeah. thing that always was was a big part of it for me but but a lot of what I do really just came from my own exploration and trying to figure out how to make all this stuff work yeah. and what I was hearing and how to make that work on the guitar and, and just, you know, making a living. Yeah. That was the whole thing. I was 13 years old and I'm getting paid for playing at weddings. It's like, yeah. hey, this is cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got to keep that going. Yeah. Keep, yeah. Beats babysitting. <laughs> beats working at the supermarket. And then I played in top 40 bands yeah. and I... You know, I was in bands of my own where we would write and, you know, try and get 
you know, a record deal. And you know, I remember walking into a meeting and the guy put on a tape and said, well, this is the music you'll be playing. And it's like, no, thank you. Yeah. You know, it was, I, I wasn't into the Johnny Bravo thing. Yeah. You know, that Brady Bunch episode. Yeah, of course. <laughs> What's the, uh, is there a new frontier for you in music? So anything you're trying to, to uh, master right now that um, we may not know of? No, I mean, I think it's just, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot more time in standard tuning. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's nice to go back to it and, and just kind of apply more knowledge. I mean, it's a continuum, you know, yeah. it's like, it's just learn something new, yeah. you know, write something new. You know, I've, I mean, I've done, I've scored movies, TV shows, video games stage musicals I, I like you know the, the I like the collaborative process mm -hmm. I think you know if I want to be I, I want to be a better improviser mm -hmm. and it's not that even that's not really about technique it's about getting to the right uh, creative space mm -hmm. so you don't get in the way of it mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think just, Derek Bailey know, wrote a whole book on that <laughs> there you go yeah. Um, yeah just to get better yeah. I mean, when I was in college, I used to go to Ronnie Scott's club, yeah. you know, and I'd see Joe Pass or Barney Castle yeah. and sit in the front row with a pack of Marlboro and a half carafe of wine from 9.30 when I could get in with my student union card mm -hmm. for like two pounds. Yeah. And then three o'clock in the morning, I'd be heading home to practice. Uh, but Alan Holdsworth was always the opening act whenever mm -hmm. they had guitar players there. So I learned a lot from watching him, too. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, you know, it's quite diverse. And then I go to folk clubs and, you know, the, the age 14 opening for Martin Carthy and, mm -hmm. you know, just sitting by the side of the stage watching this, this accomplished performer with no PA, yeah. you know, just filling a room with sound and everybody in their, you know, their Fair Isle sweaters and pints of bitter all, you know, calling out for Wild Rover and that yeah. kind of, you know, a whole different culture. Yeah. So I've kind of seen all the different cultures, the rock end of it, the jazz end, you have. the folk end, and, and that's why I, I describe what I do as borderline everything. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Can we hear one more tune, and then I know you got to run off to sound check, uh, but yeah. Still got a few minutes. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see. You know, let me get to standard tune. Okay. Um, We didn't talk about my strings. Let's hear about them. These are Monel. Okay. Uh, and this is actually my new signature, LJ's Choice from, um, yes. yeah, from Martin. Yeah. They, they gave me some sets of the Tony Rice retro strings yeah. to, to try. And I was not happy with the gauging. Because I use like a, a hybrid gauge, it's 13, 17, 24, 32, 42, 56. Okay. So it's kind of a medium light yeah. combination. And um, I, so I worked with them for a while just to get the gauging right and the core to wrap mm -hmm. ratio right. Yeah. Um, and as time went on, I just found that it was getting to be more and more interesting to yeah. me. That, there's a strong fundamental, stronger fundamental than you get with phosphor bronze. Mm -hmm. And my ears just started to adapt. And I just, I ended up liking what I was hearing. Are you putting these on all of your, even your non martin guitars? I've, I've been using them on pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I promised myself I'm going to put them on my Les Paul too, but I don't think the truss rod is going to like yeah. the heavier mm -hmm. gauges. But, you know, I have a strap with... Um, 11 and a half through 56 yeah. and it doesn't feel that way yeah it just it's just you know what works on that guitar yeah. so you never know oh let's see all right here's a Harold Arlen tune
Glad I asked for the third tune. Thank you so much, Lawrence Stewart. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs>